I was born in Muskogee, Oklahoma, one year before Black Tuesday changed the face of this nation in the 20th century. In the midst of the Great Depression, Alberta O'Donovan Askew did one of the most courageous things I could imagine. At 33 years of age, she divorced my father and took on to herself the responsibility of raising six children. We were a poor family, even after moving back to Mama's childhood home of Pensacola. But she taught us responsibility, to hold our heads high and work hard. So as a child, I shined shoes, bagged groceries, and started the largest magazine route in Pensacola. Each month, 50 cents of my earnings paid for the family water bill. For many years, Mama was an assistant housekeeper at the San Carlos Hotel. There was a very respected man at the hotel, Mr. Johnson. Like me, his first name was Reuben. And every time I rode up to the hotel on my bike, he would tell me, son, you do what's right, and one day, you're going to be governor. I, Reuben O'Donovan Askew, do solemnly swear. It was just like he was trying to undo, in the short period of time he was to be governor, for all the harm that had been done in his mind throughout the, throughout the history of, of the state of Florida. That I will support, protect, and defend the Constitution and government of the United States and of the state of Florida. In a democracy, uh, representative government, the, the, you elect people to lead, and sometimes it won't be the most popular issue, but you still have to take it on. That I am duly qualified to hold office under the Constitution of the state. It's not a showy kind of thing. It's, it's just... It's something you see that comes from inside of him, a conviction of what's right and wrong. And that I will faithfully perform the duties of the office of governor on which I am about to enter. You could take any single thing that he did and it would stand out as a tremendous achievement. And then you add up the number and it's phenomenal. I don't, I don't believe we'll ever see another governor like that. So help me God. There are really two kinds of people uh, in politics. They're not the honest and the dishonest. They're not the Republicans and the Democrats. They're the people who need it and the people who don't. Reuben Askew did not need it. So he was a political risk taker in that sense. It seemed risky to other politicians who needed it, who needed to hold the office in order to be somebody because he was willing to do things that risked losing the office. America's founding fathers recognized the spirit of democracy is not a self-regulating virtue, and that on occasion leaders must help the people rise above themselves and their own personal interest. Such leadership has been defined as political courage, and Floridians came to see it in Reuben Askew during the campaign for governor in 1970. Not many people can get elected uh, governor by advocating a new tax, uh, but that's what Reuben did. With Florida facing a $250 million deficit, Askew runs on a campaign of taxing corporations on their net profits. He says big business should pay its fair share, but the voters are slow to understand the issue. Candidate Askew then unwraps the message that will have him fitted for an inauguration tuxedo. This shirt was bought at Sears in Atlanta, Georgia. This shirt was bought at Sears in Miami. Both are identical. Both, uh, the basic cost is $6. The, the only shirt, is call Georgia, it what you may, but it was, as a former trial lawyer, lawyer, this is demonstrative evidence. Even though in Sears, last year in Georgia, they paid the state of Georgia approximately a half a million dollars in state corporate taxes while Sears in Florida was called upon to pay only $2,000. I thought I was making some fairly articulate speeches about it and, and not getting very far. When I showed them the shirts on television, they understood that. At age 42, Askew rolls into office with the corporate profits tax as his popular mandate. Implementation will take a constitutional amendment. Askew wants the measure passed in his first year as governor, but getting it in front of the people on the 1971 ballot will take a three-fourths vote of the legislature, which is being heavily lobbied by big business. 
we didn't know for sure whether we had the 90 votes or not. Uh, the machine opened, the members voted. Uh, at that time, there was the machine didn't instantaneously flash up the number. It had to count them, sort of, and it ran, it ran through this procedure. And the number that came up on the, uh, at the end was 90, precisely the number we had to have. There were three or four business lobbyists sitting uh, in the, uh, a couple of rows down from a couple of our staff members that, that I was seated with. And they jumped up and said they lied to us <laughs> when, the, when, the, when the vote came up because they thought they had us stopped. Once on the ballot, Floridians passed the measure by 70%. The additional revenues allow Askew to immediately call for repeal of regressive state consumer taxes on bank savings, household utilities, and apartment rentals. The young governor has served notice of his persistence. Growing up on the end of the socio-economic ladder, a young Reuben Askew learned of life struggles, and he came to identify with the struggles of others. As governor, he vows the Askew administration will be one of diversity. When Askew appoints Athlee Range as Secretary of Community Affairs, the Miamian becomes simultaneously the highest ranking woman and African American in Florida government. Later, Askew appoints the first black to Florida's Supreme Court and the first black cabinet member since Reconstruction. But outside the walls of the Capitol, race has become a flashpoint for citizens of the South. Eight months into Askew's first term, the governor receives word of potentially violent disruptions to the new school year. Florida is in the early stages of implementing court-ordered busing to achieve racial integration of schools, and a majority of its citizens is opposed to it. Askew also disfavors busing as a means to desegregation, but he fears what the end will be without it. I'm a product of the public school system from a poor family, and the only hope we ever have of doing better in living together is that every mother's child has a chance in life. My mother's child had that chance, and I wanted to make sure that other children had that same chance. Askew must act quickly and publicly to head off havoc planned for the new school year. During a weekend tennis match, the governor is presented with the draft of his next scheduled speech, which will take place during summer commencement at the University of Florida. The governor uh, quickly went through it, made a few marks here and there. Uh, and I wondered, frankly, when he finished, whether he really saw everything that was in the speech. What bothered me was the, the part that, in effect, that the, um, that the courts demand and the law demands that this be done. I got a sense that, that wasn't enough for me because it sounded like I if I said it, that would sound like I was hiding behind the court decision. And I said, Governor, look at this here on busing, pointing out a part of the speech. The governor looked at it. He said, yeah, that needs to be stronger. Much to the surprise of my two uh, uh, speech writers, uh, I said, well, let's just put this right where it says the, the, the law demands and just put in, and rightly so. I said, because I personally want to stand on this issue. He said, nobody really wants it, not you, not me. Not me. Not the, people, not the people, not the school, not the school boards, board, not, even the not even the courts. Yet the law demands, and rightly so, that we put an end to segregation in our society. It's the first time the leader of a southern state so strongly advocates the need to accept busing. Schools open safely in the wake of Askew's offensive, but the debate is far from over. In the spring of 1972, with the presidential campaign in the air, Florida legislators place an anti-busing question on the March primary ballot. Legally, it's a meaningless vote, but in practicality, it's a political bombshell. My concern was that, that people had a right for me to share with them why I felt as I did to help them make their decision, to help them overcome their fears as opposed to oftentimes politicians exploiting them. Although Askew knows the majority of public opposition to busing is not racially motivated, he also knows it's a sentiment he cannot overcome. 
Fearing the vote will cast Floridians as racist, Askew declares that a second question should be placed on the ballot. And so I feel very strongly that any straw ballot to come out of your chambers should include the following question. Do you favor providing an equal opportunity for quality education for all children, regardless of race, creed, color, or place of residence, and oppose a return to a dual system of public schools? I think only then will this issue be placed in proper perspective and reflect the complexity of what is involved. In an act of rare political courage and against the advice of close friends, Askew begins campaigning the issue. As predicted, Floridians vote overwhelmingly in favor of the anti-busing question. But the second issue on equal education passes by an even larger margin. Everybody that voted uh, to say they were against busing had to say they stood for quality schools. Even if it was somebody that was doing it on a purely racial grounds, they're not going to admit that to themselves or to anybody else. Askew has won more than a moral victory. Taking on the volatile issue has surprisingly increased his popularity among Floridians, who learn to respect their governor for telling them less of what they want to hear and more of what they need to. Askew's stance on busing captures the attention of leaders in his Democratic Party. With the 1972 National Convention scheduled for Miami Beach, the host governor is asked to deliver the prestigious keynote address. What can we expect them to think when the business lunch of steak and martinis is tax deductible, but the working man's lunch of salami and cheese is not? His speech is hailed as one of the best keynotes ever and is watched by an estimated 60 million viewers. Despite the national attention and offers to run as vice president, there is still much to do at home for the state's 37th governor. Erosion of the natural environment is one of the issues that motivated Askew to run for governor. Severe water problems in South Florida and a doubling of the state's population are threatening the virtues that make Florida unique. It came out of a context in which Florida had been one of the most resistant states to considering growth controls. It was thought that those were inconsistent with our free enterprise system. In the fall of 1971, at the Bell Harbor Hotel north of Miami Beach, Askew brings together every faction to be found on Florida's environmental landscape and admonishes them not to leave the meeting until they have solutions. It's been my philosophy that government rarely has answers to problems within its own family of government, but it has a responsibility to find the answers. Therefore, it reaches out. I think one of his greatest strengths is uh, working with people and helping to bring them together to be able to work on problems. And what I wanted was I wanted all these different conflicting groups to get together and say, it's important for us in Florida, now tell me what I ought to do. What results from the conference is four pieces of legislation, the most sweeping the state has seen. The acts will set up structural and substantive laws to guide growth in Florida. And in what becomes the most tangible legacy, Askew begins the state purchase of environmentally sensitive land that by the turn of the century will encompass some one and a half million acres. Since his days as a state senator, Askew has been working in a futile effort to overhaul the state courts system, and it remains a logistical nightmare. When I was practicing law as a young lawyer in, in uh, Miami, there were uh, 16 different ty types of trial courts in, in one county. Uh, it was a mess. Uh, you could select which court you wanted to uh, go to depending on what judge you thought you'd get better treatment from. So it, it was, it was in, in itself a system that invited uh, uh, corrupt activities. Dallenberg, on behalf of the governor, helps draft a court reform amendment that is bolder than anyone expects. It abolishes municipal courts along with justices of the peace, constables, and other common law antiquities. It is known as Article 5 of the Constitution. What it has meant to the people of the state is that there 
that we have a uniform judicial system throughout the state, whether you're in Lafayette County or whether you're in Dade County, you get the same sort of justice. Today, the Florida court system is considered one of the best in the nation. Askew's demand for ethical behavior earns him many nicknames in Tallahassee. But one that seems most appropriate is the code name given him by the FBI at the 1972 Democratic Convention. It will become his legacy. His religious beliefs always have reflected on the man he is. And that's what he has imparted on me. When he was elected governor, he said that there would be no alcohol served in the mansion. In the eight years he was in the mansion, there was no alcohol. Reuben Askew does not drink, he does not smoke, he does not use profanity. He's very honest, and that's the man he is in private and in public life. From the start of his governorship, Askew sets a tone of fairness and honesty by relinquishing what have been traditional forms of patronage in the governor's office, the assignment of liquor licenses and the appointment of judges. Askew places a moratorium on the licenses and begins a process of merit selection of judges that replaces patronage with proficiency. The days of buying political favor have come to an end. He certainly would say, well, thank you very much if, uh, if you decided to give him a political contribution, but he wouldn't say, buddy, you got it made now. He wouldn't say that. I remember one time I was in, in Jim Apthorpe's office and um, a guy comes in and he says, well, we're prepared to do the same thing uh, that we've done previously. And he said, what was that and who are you? I'm the guy who uh, does uh, contract work for the Department of Transportation. We, uh, we do the engineering studies and, um, and that way we get paid by the state in substantial sums of money. And we're prepared to do the same thing we've done previously. What is that? say we're prepared to pay 5% back to y'all for what uh, for what the state pays us. And Jim Apthorpe and I both sat there in amazement and Jim told him, he said, it doesn't work that way anymore. And that man would not believe he was prepared to go up on his offer because he thought somebody else had already bought uh, Governor Askew and that he just didn't understand that this was going to be done on the basis of merit rather than on the basis of money. In America, it is the time of Watergate and the public's distrust of government is not limited to Washington. In Florida, three justices of the state Supreme Court resign under pressure, as do three members of the cabinet. In each case, the departure is more or less the result of questionable financial and ethical practices. Since his days as a state senator, Askew has voluntarily filed public reports of his income tax returns and reports of his net worth. He calls for all elected officials in Florida to do the same. If you get elected to the legislature and you come up and you, you show a net worth uh, less than $100,000 and two years later you got a net worth of $400,000, I think a, a reasonable person would assume you might have used your position. Askew opens not one, not two, but three legislative sessions calling for laws to mandate financial disclosure. He has handed nothing more than watered down versions, but the governor is bolstered by a landslide re-election in 1974. And just as tax reform was his public mandate four years earlier, Askew believes it is his duty to achieve financial disclosure no matter the obstacles. He did not knuckle under, so to speak, to the politics of the time. If it didn't work one way, and he still felt the need to accomplish what he was after to make it better, he would find another way. He wasn't satisfied to say, well, we've tried, but it just didn't work. The 1968 constitutional revision has given Askew an avenue to circumvent the legislature, a petition initiative that allows citizens to place proposed constitutional amendments on the ballot. In what he calls a campaign for confidence, 
Askew takes financial disclosure to the people. The ethics in government, the open government, uh, the disclosure proposals, uh, man, those things came right out of his mouth. Those were things we would sit there and talk about and write the language. The language begins with these words. A public office is a public trust. It is printed on postcards and reprinted in newspapers throughout the state. With the spirit and strategy of an election campaign, Askew hits the ground running, working with the League of Women Voters, Common Cause, and other organizations. He spends every Saturday of four consecutive months handing out petitions at shopping malls throughout the state, seeking the necessary 210,000 signatures. By March of 1976, the petition drive is complete, becoming the first successful citizen initiative in state history. Eight months later, Floridians overwhelmingly vote in favor of what has come to be known as the Sunshine Amendment, requiring all constitutional officers and candidates to file their most recent tax returns or list assets and sources of income of more than $1,000. In a sense, that's an extraordinary invasion of someone's privacy, even a public office holder. And I've got some very good friends who strongly disagree with me on the issue. But fortunately, by three to one, the people of Florida agreed with me that they'd like to know, you know, where the money's coming from. When you have, uh, when you have position responsibility, are you gonna use it or are you gonna abuse it? As governor, Reuben Askew has been vigorous in standing up for what he believes to be right, no matter the consequences or opposition. The strength of his conviction is tested one final time before leaving office. It is 1978, and gambling interests are pouring millions of dollars into a campaign to bring casinos to South Florida. Their method is the same one Askew used to pass financial disclosure, the Citizens Initiative. He is outfinanced by more than two to one. But in shopping malls and churches and synagogues throughout the state, his opinion is priceless. On the same November ballot that elects his successor, Askew post a victory over casinos. By more than two to one, voters reject the proposed constitutional amendment. He mobilized the state to, to stop uh, that from happening. It would have changed the character of Florida. For Askew, it is a fitting way to bow out as governor. I was in the office with him the last day he was governor. And uh, the thing that I remember most is that Reuben, I was getting very nostalgic, although I'd only been there two years. But as we turned and walked out the door for the last time, I turned back and looked and sort of took in the moment. And Reuben never looked back. He's not, a, he's not a person that looks to the past other than to learn, but he's always thinking about today and tomorrow. Shortly after leaving office, Askew is summoned to Washington, where President Jimmy Carter assigns him a cabinet-level position and ambassador status as United States Trade Representative. Four years later, he seeks the presidency himself, traveling over 360,000 miles and visiting all 50 states. But it is not meant to be. Still, the 1980s cement Askew's place in history. At his alma mater's, Florida State University and the University of Florida, Askew is bestowed honorary doctorates and distinguished alumni awards. At FSU, he is named Alumnus of the Century. And at Harvard University, a study in the John F. Kennedy School of Government places Askew alongside Woodrow Wilson and Theodore Roosevelt as one of the 10 best American governors of the 20th century. His career reads like a textbook for the American way of public service, and Askew is invited to share his story in the university classroom. Resident and visiting fellowships at Harvard and Yale, respectively, are followed by a permanent professorship at Florida Atlantic University. During that time, he often had the highest in teaching evaluations in the school and uh, in the college on many occasions. Uh, indeed, uh, he was selected by his students as the uh, Outstanding Teacher of the Year. My dad's a natural born 
teacher. He taught me, we'd sit and watch football games and he'd teach me the signals, he'd teach me the plays. He just, he, the man knows so much about everything. In 1994, Florida State University establishes the Reuben S. U. School of Public Administration and Policy. The first time an academic program at FSU has been named for an individual. In Gainesville, the University of Florida establishes the Askew Institute of Politics and Society. With Donna Lou at his side, Askew takes his class on the road. Traveling more than 100,000 miles by the end of the century, he will teach at least one semester at each of the 10 state universities. I require my students to sign on, the, on their honor how much of the reading material they've actually read. And um, there, there, there were times when just, just after they'd filled them in, I'd remind them and I'd say, you know, if your integrity doesn't mean anything to you, if your name doesn't mean anything to you, if, if the reputation doesn't mean, then put whatever you want to put on it. But if it means what I think it means to you, you know, put what you actually read. And you would, inv and invariably I'd get copies of papers where they'd scratched out the original uh, thing and put, it, put in another one. In the end, perhaps this will be the legacy of Reuben Askew. More than anything, he has made us a better people by asking more of us, teaching us to lift our gaze, just as he did in that 1971 busing speech when he said, ideals are like stars. You will not succeed in touching them with your hands, but like the seafaring man on the desert of waters, you choose them as your guides, and following them, you will reach your destiny. He is a fine husband. He is, is a good father. Even though he wasn't there all the time because he was busy running the state, flying to and from, or what have you, he was always there when I needed him. He demanded the truth from us. He held us accountable for our mistakes, and he praised us for our successes. He was a very positive person at home.